This day-long event took place last December 5th in New York at Columbia University, and it convened women activists, feminist activists, from around the world. Want to get a little bit of an insight into how race, gender, colonialism, war, and all the rest actually intersect? What intersectionality is, in fact? Well, listen up. What you didn't hear in the last many months of election debate I suspect you'll hear some of right here in this discussion. This week's program features, among others, Francis Garrett and Kimberly Williams Crenshaw. Next week, we'll hear from Eve Ensler, Monique Wilson, and more. So stay tuned. This is Bodies of Revolution, brought to you this week and next from The Laura Flanders Show. It was in the middle of the raging of World War I that responding to a call by a Dutch woman doctor, 1,300 women made their way from around the world. At that time, it was the nations that were engaged in war, Northern Europe, Canada, the United States. From our shores, from this port, women got on cruisers. Those were the days, cruise ships and sailed across stormy waters of the Atlantic to participate in a conference at The Hague where they called not only for no more war, but they called for their foreign policy rights, their right to vote, their reproductive rights, their right to earn enough of a living to, make a, to feed their families, but also their right to participate in foreign policy decisions. And in, 15, in 1919, as the nations of the world were holding a peace conference and coming up with the peace terms at the end of World War I, they went to those men in Versailles and they said, your peace accord is going to sow more war. Your peace accord is going to give the fruits of war to the victors and is going to create discord and animosity amongst the nations that will lead to future wars. We demand a seat at the table. And they published a charter that demanded a seat at the peacemaking table for women and demanded that war be taken off the list of political options for nations as they consider how to resolve their conflict. They also called for wages for mothers and living wages and rights at the workplace, you name it. They were abolitionists. They were suffragists, but their demand for foreign policy rights is the thing that's at my top of my head right now. It's a lot of what brings us here together. You're going to hear from the most extraordinary women, women who are finding ways to resolve conflict without violence where they live, who are up against wars, wars named and unnamed, who are making peace and forcing themselves to the table. And we need them, and we need us to be working together more than ever. My dream is that we would come out of this day with the makings of another women's charter. There was a problem with the picture. You're going to hear a lot about people's snapshots that they bring into the room today. And the snapshot that I bring into the room is the snapshot of that women's gathering at The Hague. But there's a problem with that picture of those 1,300 women. As far as I could see from those grainy pictures, they were all white women. And I would suspect that that, that is a huge reason why they failed as far as they did. We are learning, we are learning with the help of our sisters how to work in intersectional ways, how to make alliances, how to build sisterhood in a new way. To me, maybe we have accomplished something in the last century, if not stopping war, at least practicing intersectional politics and sisterhood. You're going to see it in action. And I thank you all for coming out today. It really means a lot to all of us. I'm here to introduce a Climbing Poetry. I think they are two of the most extraordinary women I know. They write beautiful words. They stand up for social justice, whether it's environmental justice, whether it's street harassment, whether it's police shootings, whether it's war. And I have to say, they have found a way to weave art, to weave heart, to weave social, social justice into one beautiful, beautiful web of gorgeousness. So please welcome Climbing Poetry. 
every single life is significant. A right to breathe is legitimate. Who are you to judge who's worthy of love? A cold blood, my sister's innocent. Her black life mattered, but you ended it. You illiterate to the magnificence inscripted on her face, couldn't read the story of her greatness. Everyone she touched in all the places, blink of the eye, you pulled the trigger, now just blankness, it's shameless. No penalty, no remedy, it's heinous. It was legal to enslave us, now it's legal to erase us. Cause it don't matter. It don't matter if the street smarts is mathematical, dark skin galactical. This here is Earth, and we are chess pieces in a violence so systematical. It's, it's remarkable. remarkable when from the margins we grow dialectical. Cause it don't matter if her name is Sharice or his name is Michael. Every 28 hours, the police carves out, out their cycle. cycle. From a violence so rooted in hate, you can trace back the ones who found God. In Sunday lynching revivals. Bring into the room for us, paint a picture for us that enables us all to get better at understanding how our, so our situation relates to your situation. Everyone put your hand up. Okay, so as you hear a name you don't know, put your hand down. Okay, Mike Brown. Eric Garner. Freddie Gray, Tamir Rice, Michelle Cousseau, Shelly Frey, Kayla Moore, Rakia Boyd, Tanisha Anderson, Ara Russer. Okay, so now if we look around and just take, take a moment, this is a snapshot I want to take. How, how many hands are still up? About, about a half dozen or so. Now, uh, thank you everyone. So, so this is a picture of intersectional erasure. Every woman's name that I mentioned was a black woman who was killed by the police within two weeks of one of the other men who was killed by the police. Now, we say say her name as a way of broadening the movement against state-sanctioned violence, but the reality is we can't say their names if we don't know them. And we don't know them unless our movement lifts them up, unless the media report on them, unless we demand to know. So my picture is quite frankly this. This is an audience of people who are motivated to know these names, motivated to lift up women who've been killed by the police. But that's not enough in order to actually be able to lift up the names. We have to take far more agency around discovering, uncovering, and speaking into the invisibility that makes so many women vulnerable to state-sanctioned violence. Let's talk about the connections. Um, yesterday when we were sharing stories, there were so many minutes, so many moments where somebody would say, oh, that re that, I relate to that, or I re that reminds me of this, or that's connected to this. We called it the, um, let me, you're, you're telling my story uh, st moment. Um, Monique, do you have a, did you hear a telling my story moment here? Yeah, I think with everyone. <laughs> totally with How everyone. So? Because with my sister in Colombia, it's land. We're fighting for land. I think that's really crucial. If you have no access to land, then you can't eat, you can't grow crops. It's very, very basic. And they don't need much, just land. With my sister from Sri Lanka, it's the, the resistance, the women's struggle and how powerful that is. But in so many ways, it's always getting suppressed because I think it's, it's, it's really a threatening force. And of course, with my other sisters, it's the brutality of our own state. I mean, of course, we, we want to end U.S. imperialism in all, our, in all our countries, but it's our own puppet governments that are also making it happen, allowing it, selling our sovereignty away. So yes, I think it's... It, I think all of us are tied. And then, of course, within that, there's the misogyny of patriarchy in all its forms because war is patriarchal and misogynist. Occupation is patriarchal and misogynist. And not just the occupation of war, but the economic occupation. You know, there's a lot being sold to us and brainwashed to us that it's supposed to be for our development as developing countries. When, in fact, for many millennia of years, we didn't need foreign people in our, in our shores. And now they say we have to westernize you, colonize you, and develop you. All these situations have uh, brought me to the conclusion that definitely we, are, we as women, are, are suffering uh, even harder the consequences of this mm. conflict for land, for, uh, multi well, for those multinationals who want to get profit 
out of our, not only our natural resources, but our body. My husband, he, he was a well-known businessman in Somalia. And we had a lot of business. And when he passed away, we didn't get anything because I didn't have a son. I have three girls, which is 2015. I never thought that's going to happen because that is the situation. And it seems like Somalia, we're going back instead of going forward because of the lack of education. Everything is privatized, and some pe a lot of young girls they don't go to school because they can't afford it, and it's not public schools. And the difference is, uh, when I was young, actually education was free. We used to go to school. It doesn't matter if you're poor or rich. Now it's we don't have that, and and that is the thing. Our generation is struggling to tell the young girls under 25 that is not the way we're supposed to live and that is not, way, it's not the way we know. Those stories are the stories that um, Partoon is talking about, you know, issues we don't think of as human rights issues. What about boredom in refugee camps? What about the fact that you have to sit there for 10 days with nothing to do, or 10 years, sorry. Um, what does boredom do to people? What does the lack of information do to people? I think part of the story also has to be the roots and causes. Because we've been talking for a long time, you know, 17, 18, 20 years about violence against women issues. And I think we don't look at all the policies that are above us that are forcing, for example, 12 million of our Filipinos to go abroad to find jobs. And even if our young movement have been fighting for the right to education, we've been rising for education because education is not a, not a privilege but a right. Even if they actually then get college degrees, there's still no jobs here because you know, the, 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 the global policies are just keeping everybody uh, subservient, dependent, and economically um, tied to what the West is telling us we need to do. Much of what we're trying to do is change the narrative. And some of changing the narrative is, is telling stories that haven't been heard or putting stories that are usually heard in one context in a context when we're not used to hearing them. How does the, you know, this idea that we're trying to create now, this profile of a female terrorist now that San Bernardino has happened in Paris, and how does that, you know, map onto the profile that's existed in our heads for a long time, the narrative about the black woman or the narrative about who she is and, and um, that she's more resilient and that she's more, you know, that she doesn't need any help, right? How do we sort of... Um, collectively challenge these narratives now, and, and, and where are the spaces where they're sort of mapped onto women's bodies in the exact same way? You know, how does the surveillance state and the police brutality um, affect women of color, it affect South Asian women, affect black women? You know, these are the narratives that I think are, are a little more difficult, they're a little more complicated. The stories that we're keeping far away from each other, the narratives that we've kept very far away from each other, you now everybody asks, well, why did this woman blow herself up, and why was she angry, and why did she engage in violence? And I was speaking to someone yesterday at CNN, and I said, but why do you wait for this moment and then go looking for all these tiny details of this woman's life, that she had blonde hair, she read Harry Potter, she listened to Coldplay, when you've literally got five million women from Syria who are begging you to hear any of their stories, who are begging you to be seen and, and pay a little bit of attention to them, and why do you think the two are not connected to each other? There's this notion somehow that once America arrives, life begins. You know, the truth of the matter is that the most empowered women in the world are living everywhere. Okay, and that's an assumption, you know, and, and we should just assume that we don't know better more and we haven't moved further. Everybody's moving. Here's the good news and the bad news. Misogyny, the oppression of women is a global virus. It's so amazing how you can listen to how it has evolved and applied itself and, and escalated in each country in its particular cultural way. But what's also true is that women are fierce, empowered, radical, smart, and feisty in every country. And one of the things I've learned from City of Joy um, is that when women are in their own country, in control of their own destinies, in the way that they need to do it, women rise. It's just a given. And part of what we have to do from this country is respect that, honor that, and find resources to let them do that if that's what people need. Mm. I thought of a case of a friend of mine who's Garifuna, that is an Afro-indigenous community in Honduras. And she said to me that once um, there was this feminist organization that got there, and they saw that Garifuna's woman 
uh, made cassave, which is like this traditional food. And it took them so long to make it. Uh, so what they decided was give them money so they would buy an electronic tool to make cassava. And my friend said to me, like, the result of that intervention was that then women didn't have a time to speak of their problems, which is was all around making cassava, you see? And then, like, the time that they saved that due to the intervention of this NGO, uh, they spent that watching soap operas. So... What I think definitely is that um, for for there to be a very healthy um, participation, I think, or for us to build a better world together, we have to respect each other. You have to ask the other person how is their work, the world, and their context going on, so you have a, a better approach. And if like even so, I think you have to let them do their own thing, as it said before. So it is, it is key that we consider the other person we're working with as a dignified one. You see, their voice matter. You have to hear their voice. Let them uh, make their own choice. So you don't make an, a violent intervention and reproduce violent cycle. Ping, it looks like you're thinking a story about your action. Tell us a little bit about your work, what you do. I want to start uh, from since from three years ago in 2012 uh, in Valentine's Day. Some of my Chinese feminist friends they uh, did a public event called uh, "Heard It uh, Bright." This activist they uh, they were in the center area of Beijing wearing wedding gowns with blood. That is a response to uh, V Day. It was really cold and freezing that day. I I'm really proud that my young uh, friends they wear such a thin wedding gown and walking on the street. Soon police came and just uh, asked them to leave. Uh, in the past three years, this uh, blood, wedding gown with blood become the typical and uh, representative image of China's uh, feminist movement. They're wearing the wedding gown with blood in front of the court to support the mixed violence victims. They're wearing these gowns in the middle of uh, city libraries and talk about these uh, domestic violence issues with them. We also have male volunteers who wear these wedding gowns and you know, to sh them show support. However, in early March this year, uh, five of my young feminist friends were arrested and detained by the Chinese government. So the police were very interested in this uh, story behind this wedding gown with blood as well. <laughs> this uh, bloody wedding gown uh, indicates our inspiration of this, our fighting strategy, and it's a strategy that we would like to share, especially the the courage of these young feminist activists. So I think part of also being in a movement, a movement that is attached to the grassroots communities, is that you are awakened every day to what realities are there. And you get inspired yourself to move. And there is no other option but to serve. Like we have to serve. And it doesn't matter if you're a writer, poet, actress, teacher, we all have our roles to play in there. And I think that is what solidarity also is. And that also is what it means by standing with each other. That your story is also my story, and it's everyone's story, and we cannot separate ourselves from that. I think it's also um, looking at what is grassroots-based run and determined by local women on the ground, and what is internationally imposed and has internationals at the top of the organization in that country. We are very strong women in Somalia, and we want to be part of the peacemaking. So it's always saying, oh, as it comes to the bees, women has to be by, uh, not involved. They don't include the women, and they don't include the youth. And that is the people who really suffer it. And that is the people who wanted to be part of the change. But having a few guys saying, this is what we wanted, it's not going to work. And it doesn't work so far. And that is why we want a woman to be part of the peacemaking in Somalia. Um, I do believe that fundamentally women will lead to a more peaceful world, but plenty of the women who have been involved in most of these conflicts, you know, were fighters and were hardline nationalists or were hardline, whether you agreed with it or not, 
you don't have a successful piece by um, a certain number of women, a certain number of men. You have it by a diversity of politics and a diversity of perspectives that led to this war. You know? So I think it's really important to acknowledge, yes, women, yes, youth, but the variation sort of in the politics that they have. You know? And um, yeah, I think the, the question on uh, militarization is really important. Militarization is insidious. And so you don't see it with a gun all the time. You don't see it in, in front of you, right? I mean, we had these civilian defense form, farms in Sri Lanka where they took the Tamil women and the military had them working there, and ostensibly it's an agricultural development program, right? But it is a militarized space where they're beholden to the military. They run the hotels, they run the vegetable stands, but you can't tell that it's them, right? And in this country, you have black girls in Atlanta who walk through five different checkpoints to get to the cafeteria. That is militarization, you know? Um, the fact that our police can print out 3D drones, that is militarization, right? So we don't see it in front of us physically, but it is actually one of those areas where we find the strong connections because in its insidiousness, we see it everywhere. This education of that, uh, the nationalism is everywhere in China, this uh, whole narrative that China is now powerful, it's growing, rising, it prevents uh, people to critically think the policies of the government. Nationalism is uh, a, ga a game of this patriarchal system. In the history, it, many times, it just ex it's a way to exploit women. The English writer Virginia Woolf said, one, uh, said uh, women does not have ho homeland. But in the past several years, I understand this uh, saying more and more deeply. Only when we don't have a country, we can end this conflict between countries. Thank you, Peng, for reminding us of Virginia Woolf's line. If you want to look it up, it's in Three Guineas. And she said, as a woman, I have no country. As a woman, my country is the whole world. So we gain much more than we lose. Well, that was part one of a two-part special, Bodies of Revolution, featuring the comments of an international panel of women activists convened in New York by V-Day and the Columbia Institute for Intersectionality and Social Studies. You can find out more on our program next week about how the women of the world saw our election debate play out. Check out all our archives and find out more about this program and how you can support it at lauraflanders.com, and thanks. <laughs>